tonight. Tesla likes the taste of poached apple. Facebook Sheryl Sandberg leans in even further. And we're not nearly done talking about net neutrality. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. <laughs> this is Tech News Tonight, episode 270 for Friday, February 6th. 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Invest in yourself for 2015. lynda.com has thousands of courses to help you learn new tech, business, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the tech feed. Apple might have convinced everyone in the world to buy an iPhone, but they still need to do better, do a better job convincing their employees to keep working there. According to reporters at Bloomberg Business, Tesla has poached at least 150 former Apple employees. In fact, Tesla has nabbed more employees from Apple than they have from any other company, even other car companies. Tesla CEO Elon Musk says that Apple's been trying to steal his employees too, offering $250,000 signing bonuses and 60% salary increases. According to Musk, so far, Apple has gotten very few takers. And here's an update to a story we started following yesterday. U.S. insurer Anthem was hacked, exposing over 80 million records, including social security numbers, birthdays, email addresses, and employee information. Today, we learned that none of that information was encrypted. A spokesperson from Anthem Blue Cross in California claims that because the hack started with a compromised administrator's account, no amount of encryption could have prevented it. Customers in Alabama and California have already filed class action lawsuits against the company, claiming that their information was not adequately protected. And Obama's cy cybersecurity advisor, Michael Daniel, called the hack quite concerning. Um, yeah. Today on Facebook, Facebook CEO Sheryl Sandberg announced a new Facebook partnership with LinkedIn, the Anita Borg Institute, and Sandberg's own Lean In project. The new initiative is aimed at college students studying math, engineering, and computer science, and is designed to help women from peer form peer support groups within the Lean In Circles program that Sandberg launched a few years ago. In an interview, Sandberg said, the reason there aren't more women in computer science is because there aren't more women in computer science. And to that, I say, yet. This week's top story was the news that FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler proposed reclassifying broadband internet as a telecommunications service. Now, this will give the commission legal authority to issue common sense rules about how cable and phone companies treat their customers. Under those regulations, those companies would not be able to block or slow down information on their networks, including mobile networks. We've invited Jason Abruzzizi, to reporter at Mashable, to talk about what we know right now about net neutrality. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for having me. So I know this isn't the most exciting topic in the world, but what's at stake is really exciting. So I know you were on the call on Wednesday. What's the most important thing to know about Wheeler's proposal? Well, I think you, you showed it right there in that New Yorker piece by Tim Wu, who, who's the man who coined the term net neutrality. Um, you know, net neutrality advocates think that uh, the FCC got it right. This is the most aggressive attempt to, uh, you know, install some form of net neutrality rules uh, that we've ever seen. It, it has been called the nuclear option. It, it really is the most severe way that they could have gone uh, gone about this. And that's why you see net neutrality advocates like uh, Tim Wu rejoicing right now. So, I mean, is it as far as they could have go, gone? I mean, we were talking earlier about there's certain parts of Title II that they won't apply. So, so sure. which parts are they applying and which parts aren't they applying? <sighs> So what they're trying to do here is, is really kind of, you know, get all of the most effective parts of Title II, this particular type of regulation, while, uh, you know, alleviating certain clauses that would instill certain things like rate regulation, basically saying that the FCC can control the pricing. The FCC is saying we're not going to uh, be enforcing that. We're not going to try to regulate your rates. We're not going to try to tell you that you have to allow other networks to use your, your infrastructure all we're saying is that we're going to use this rule to institute net neutrality and nothing else. As now, whether you believe that or not, you know it depends on which side you come down on. So, so that part of regulation is what kind of made uh, Wall Street. I mean, there there was we have a chart I think that said like what the stocks of those cable companies looked like right after Wheeler's announcement, and all the stocks went up. So, yes. 
uh, that that was due to what you're just talking about, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think for for the internet service providers, the, you know, they're saying to themselves and their investors are saying this this could have been worse. It could have been just pure Title II. It could have given the FCC the power to control how much we're charging. Instead, they're saying, like, we're not going to try to touch that. We're not going to try to touch how you operate your business. All we're saying is that you treat data the same way. And if you do so, you're never going to have a problem with us. And so in that sense, you know, investors who may have been expecting the worst saw that and were like, well, this could have been this, this, this you know, this could have been more detrimental. And therefore, you know, maybe it's time to buy back into the stock. Uh, th I think there's one other aspect to actually talk about here which is that Comcast and Time Warner stock uh, experienced some of the best boost, whereas uh, AT&T, Verizon stayed about flat. Um, the people I talked to say that there could be two reasons. It's, it's tough to parse exactly what's going on, but Comcast, as you know, um, is, you know, acquired Time Warner, and that is, uh, excuse me, Time Warner Cable. That deal is yet to be approved. Some people think that if these uh, net neutrality regulations go through, there's a better chance of that acquisition being uh, allowed, which is something that investors want very much. The other aspect is that um, the new net neutrality regulations apply to mobile internet as well. They didn't used to do that. So now you've got a much more far-reaching type of regulation. Uh, how that impacts companies like AT&T and Verizon that obviously are, are big mobile internet providers remains to be seen. So maybe that could be a reason you saw a little bit less uh, enthusiasm from investors uh, for those company stocks. Right. So there's a lot of people that are looking really deeply at the numbers and saying, well, it could have been worse. But there's a lot of people also just here's that chart that I was talking about before about the, mm -hmm. the um, where the stocks went up after his announcement. But there's a lot of people that are just saying um, this is so bad. This is horrible. Um, you know, the and it's a, it's ironic. They're saying in one sense, like the government shouldn't control, um, you know, the cable companies. But at the same time, they're saying they don't want, you know, an Internet fast lane. So, so what's going on there? I, you know, that's a tough position to defend right now. One of the main problems is that we, we don't have a federal government that's really in a place to write new internet regulations. The ideal way to deal with this would be not to use old regulation uh, that, you know, was written, you know, decades ago to try to regulate the internet, which is a relatively modern invention. Uh, the best way would be, you know, if Congress was able to write some sort of order that said, you know, you know basically you have to treat all data on these broadband networks the same. Unfortunately, we don't have that, which is why the FCC is trying to make these old rules backward compatible to what we have now. So what do you think will happen when the Republicans take the White House, if they take the White House? I mean, will what will happen then? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it's tough to say, of course, but, you know, if, if, if I had to guess, you know, there's a decent chance that this gets rolled back eventually. One of the things that happens is, you know, if this gets voted into law, we could see it in place for, you know, two years, then... Uh, if a Republican president gets elected, he gets to appoint, uh, you know, the five FCC commissioners and the breakdown ends up being three, you know, for whatever party is in power this time, you know, assuming that it's the Republicans and two for the Democrats. Those Republicans can then basically, you know, shape the, the regulations they see fit. Uh, you've seen that net neutrality regulation has kind of, you know, cropped up as an issue among Republicans, particularly, uh, you know, anti-regulation uh, Republicans. And, you know, they're not a big fan of this title, too. And we've seen uh, some of the Congress uh, pe men in Congress uh, already, you know, moving to, to, to stop this rule. So there's a decent chance that, you know, this isn't the last chapter. And if there is a Republican president, uh, this could be completely reversed. Right. So uh, let's talk earlier in the week. I was I brought up John Oliver, and I think you talked about him also uh, with Mike on our morning show that, I mean, Wheeler sort of had a different opinion. And then John Oliver is from his HBO show came out and just said, you know, this is not OK. What, what role do you think that John Oliver, this, you know, fake TV star had on uh, changing people's minds? And changing Wheeler's uh, mind eventually. Yeah, I think it was a big one. I can remember the day coming in, um, you know, after that and, and just seeing how, how it blew up. And every, everybody was finally talking about net neutrality again. And, and uh, you know, he deserves a lot of credit, uh, you know, for coming up with such a great segment and communicating something that really isn't the sexiest, most interesting topic and, and getting a lot of people to pay attention. But he probably does owe FCC Chairman T uh, Tom Wheeler uh, an apology for calling him a dingo. <laughs> Considering that Wheeler has now proposed the strongest net neutrality regulations we've ever seen. Right. Yeah. We don't recommend calling people dingoes, <laughs> but it did change his mind. So maybe it, it, it would work. <laughs> yeah. It, it's interesting. I mean, I think that um, John Stewart has done the same thing. It's like this satire TV sometimes has the power to change the government, which is really interesting. Yeah, and, and I mean, anytime you can communicate something as complicated and, and obtuse as net neutrality, even even the words tend to put people to sleep. 
You can do it in a way that John Oliver uh, and John Stewart have done it with, with not just this topic too, but other topics. I mean, it's, it's an it's incredibly powerful, and it's also just you know incredibly probably good for for society in general. Right. So, Jason, what are you working on next? What's your next big story? Next big story. I'm you know I I'm fascinated by online video right now. I think you know kind of what Facebook's been doing with video, Twitter rolling out its own video, uh, what Snapchat's doing with Discover. I think that what these uh, these platforms are doing with with media and their embrace of media. It, you know, has major ramifications for uh, not just the problems, but for also for media companies, uh, you know, ourselves at Mashable. You know, we definitely have to be, you know, aware of, you know, who's consuming our content, how they're consuming it. And um, when, uh, when content ends up on these platforms, you lose a little bit of control, uh, particularly on the business side. That has, you know, major, major impact on, um, you know, how we're able to handle our business and, and how people are able to cover uh, topics like net neutrality. Right, true. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Jason's a reporter at Mashable. You can, what's your Twitter hand, hand, handle? Is it just your just name? Just Jason or Bruzies. If you can spell it right, you can, you'll can. you be able to find me. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Have a nice weekend. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Coming up, GNU money for an email privacy expert and why you should never text and go wailing. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. It's already February. What? are you waiting for? You need to invest in yourself this year and learn some new, something new with a free 10-day trial to lynda.com. lynda.com is used by millions of people all over the world. It has over 4,500 courses on topics like web development, photography, visual design, business, Excel, WordPress, Photoshop, and so many more. Are you looking to get started with photography or improve the photos that you take? I recommend lynda.com courses like Photoshop CC Essential Training, Pixel Playground with Bert Monroy, and the Creative Quick Tip series where Justin Seeley gives you five-minute tutorials to improve your creative skills in Photoshop, Illustrator, and more. Whether you just have 15 minutes or if you have 15 hours or more, each course is structured so you can learn at your own pace and on your own schedule from start to finish. My favorite thing about lynda.com is that all the courses are taught by experts who are accomplished professionals at the top of their field. No newbies. Do something good for yourself in 2015 and sign up for a free 10-day trial to lynda.com by visiting lynda.com slash TN2. You'll get unlimited access to every course on lynda.com, including access on your iOS and your Android devices, plus new courses as they're added each week. That's L Y N D A dot com slash T N two to try it free for 10 days. Go ahead. I challenge you to learn something new. And now on to a few more stories we're following today. Last week, the website ProPublica reported that the man responsible for the free email encryption software used by Edward Snowden was about to go broke. Werner Koch created the GNU Privacy Guard in 1997. And even though it's been widely used by Snowden, as well as journalists, dissidents, and others, Koch had been maintaining and patching the email privacy tool on his own, and he was about to give up. But late yesterday, ProPublica updated their story to say that Koch had received a one-time grant of $60,000 from, from the Linux Foundation's core infrastructures initiative, as well as over $137,000 in donations on his website. Facebook and the online payment processor Stripe also public pledge to donate $50,000 a year to Koch's project. Chinese website IT Home has leaked screenshots that appear to be Windows 10 mobile. If the screenshots are legit, they show us a bit about what to expect when the technical preview of Windows 10 mobile comes out sometime this month. It looks like the context menus will closely match the desktop and tablet versions of Windows 10. There also seems to be two new keyboards designed for large screen phones. The most important thing to note is that a screenshot leak like this one probably means that the technical preview will be out soon. Doing your taxes is fun. And now thanks to fraud, it's even funner. Intuit, the maker of TurboTax, took precautionary steps and yesterday halted e-filing for all state taxes. Here's what was happening. Apparently when some filers logged into TurboTax to file their state tax return, their taxes had already been filed. The fraudulent activity occurred in a handful of states, including Minnesota, Alabama, Utah, South Carolina, and New York. Intuit believes taxpayer information had been obtained from other sources outside the tax preparation process and not through TurboTax. 
According to Forbes, TurboTax has 60% of the filing software market. The company said in a statement they hope to begin turning the systems back on starting today. This does not affect federal tax filings. And finally, have you ever wondered what would have happened if Captain Ahab had an iPhone? Well, Moby Dick might not have been such a crazy long book for one. Also, it might have looked a little bit like this. Professional photographer Eric Smith says he took this picture of a man on his private sailboat in Redondo Beach, California, where he continued to text as a humpback whale surfaced only two feet in front of him. And the man never looked up from his phone. So let this be a lesson to you to look up from your phone every once in a while. And on a personal note, my cousin is the captain of a whale watching boat in Monterey. And he says he's seen more than one person drop their iPhones into the blowholes of nearby whales while they're photographing them. So don't say I didn't warn you. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can also write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.